Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, from me, Guy Monson, filming from home, social distancing like the rest of us. I'm here with a second weekly update on global strategy, macroeconomics, and financial markets. My first slide is from the WHO situation report of the 26th of March, and it makes quite, quite grim reading. You see, we are now, now a truly global pandemic, uh, blue across the screen, uh, emerging world, Africa, the Americas. And you'll see the dark blue section, uh, greater than 50,000 infections, now moving on from Europe over to the US. In terms of trend lines on slide three, there is some encouraging information. First of all, the three lower lines, the trend in Singapore, in Japan, and South Korea in green, are flatlining and are lower than the trajectories of Europe and the Americas. They indicate that tough containment measures, effective social distancing, can flatten the trajectory. And we're hoping, as you can see on the China numbers at the top, to replicate that effect in Europe as the lockdown intensifies. More worrying, you can see the trajectory in pink of the United States. The third challenge after Asia and Europe and the Americas is the emerging world. And you can see on the right of slide three that alarmingly infection rates are beginning to grow across all the emerging world countries, even as I'm sure reporting is relatively understated. And that will be a big challenge with social safety nets so much smaller than we see in the West. Moving to slide four, we've attempted to model this. When we last talked, we had done the work for Europe and China. Now we've done this globally. And you can see on the uh, left-hand box of slide four that we're looking at a base case drawdown of around 2.7 to 3.7 percent of GDP. Now we've based that just on looking at services industries, which are about 65 percent of global GDP, at least in the developed world. We're assuming a 35% drawdown in the quarter of crisis, Q1 for Asia, Q2 for Europe and America, a 10% drawdown in Q2, and a 5% drawdown in Q3, and some sort of normalization by year end. The impact, as you'll see, is particularly intense in the Eurozone, because particularly in Spain, Portugal, and Italy, and to an extent the UK, services and hospitality are a very large portion of the underlying economy. At 27 to 3.7% of GDP, let's say 3.2% middle number, that is almost double the drawdown that we saw in the great financial crisis of 2008-9. And as you can see in the bars on the right of slide four, this is only the second dollar decline in global GDP that we've seen in the last 50 years. But governments are responding, and there is going to be a substantial fiscal offset. Led by the United States is 2 trillion, 10% of GDP package, which may still get bigger. In fact, I think it's quite possible there's a second package in April or May. But it is well diversified, effective. And if you look at, say, the 250 billion of personal payments, those are direct $1,200 per adult, every adult in the States, 500 for every child that goes straight into consumer bank accounts. It's being replicated broadly on Chancellor Sunak's Go Big, Go Early program with direct fiscal help, although on an even larger scale. Where we're still seeing some blockage is, yes, national governments in Europe are reacting well, but the European Union as a whole is still battling over whether to leave, issue a mutually funded corona bond. The rumours of a six-hour conference call yesterday to try and battle through these issues as Germany, the Netherlands and Austria stand firm against liabilities being neutralised. Let's see where this goes. If there is a chink of light, it's a huge step forward for the Eurozone. But the impact is going to be large and we're just beginning to get the data. Of course, the data is still not caught up with reality. Jobless claims of 3.28 million are absolutely extraordinary on slide six, and I'm afraid they could get larger. Of the 152 million people employed in the US, 32 million, that's one in five, are in the retail, leisure, or hospitality sectors. So you can see the sheer magnitude of these numbers for a country without elaborate unemployment benefits. 
On the right, you can see some of the manufacturing surveys and composite surveys starting to come through from business. This is the market numbers. We'll see more numbers uh, at the beginning of next month. But drops from 50, which is neutral, to between 27 and 40 are very dramatic. In the UK, I, can, yeah, I would expect to see at least a drop in line with the global average, possibly slightly larger. We will be projected by two things. One, the stent of Charles Sassoonek's package of benefits, and also the uh, relatively low unemployment rates we're starting with, strong wheel wages, and of course, a weak sterling. Note at the worst point last week on the right of slide seven, that fell actually below the 2008 nine levels. So what are financial markets? Well, you can see the S&P 500 corrections from peak on the next slide. And I've looked at a series of stock markets and uh, as they enter bear markets from 1929, 1987, 1980, the tech crash in 2000, the financial crisis in 08, the European crisis in 2011. And while the crisis we've seen is by no means the largest, it is the fastest. Now, this has some benefits as well as some offsets. The fact it was so dramatic prompted dramatic central bank action. And also, as dramatically as it goes down, it can also revive if there is greater clarity of the trajectory of the progression of the virus. At the beginning of last week, things were tense. There was disorderly feel in markets. Exceptional bearishness crept in. On the left-hand chart of slide nine is the famous US bull bear spread, which tracks sentiment, almost as bearish as ever recorded. That's interesting, normally a sign of a market rebound. On the right, the US put call ratio, the more puts, the more defensive people are feeling, that number hit a record. So it's unsurprising that when central banks came in big to backstop, not just uh, the normal financial markets, but commercial paper, corporate bonds, money markets, primary dealers, there was a strong response. You can see the rally in markets on slide 10. The red line UK equities, the light blue line world equities, beginning to pick up and volatility on the right beginning to roll over. I'm afraid this isn't the end of the crisis. So we could see more lows and new highs, but at least there is a normalization of trading market conditions. And this is for us at Saracen, the first phase of adding in a component of risk. But reality has got to catch up. Uh, the data, rather, has got to catch up with the reality of where the big hit is going to be is in profits and, I'm afraid, dividends. I've no estimate yet for how big those will be, but I'll illustrate it by showing you the US manufacturing PMI in light blue. With the uh, index level on the left, I can expect that to fall into the high 30s. And the red line is 12-month EPS growth. And you can see those move pretty well together. So there's a big drawdown coming. That means all our analysts are working on stress testing our positions, looking at balance sheet, looking at funding, mirroring those outcomes against the economic projections we have, and looking at the underlying thematic patterns. And we're not exposed to energy, we're not exposed to materials, we're weakly exposed to industrials, and we have a limited bank portfolio. So we'll mitigate some of that effect, but that's what we're learning and that's what our analysts are working on as we speak before we add back money. Just one final encouraging point. The Federal Reserve moved fast last week to extend its swap lines for US dollars, not just to the regular big central banks, but also to Brazil, to Mexico, to Denmark, to Sweden. This eased a lot of the dollar crisis that was so pernicious in 08, 09. You can see currencies against the dollar beginning to stabilize, the euro bouncing, the pound bouncing. This is very important. Secondly, the extremely ambitious backstop to the corporate bond markets introduced by the Federal Reserve has meant that investment grade spreads are nowhere near the levels they were in 08, 09. Now, we haven't got perfect liquidity back, but there is opportunity again and a functioning corporate bond market. So what does this mean in practice for our policy? Well, on my last call, I reminded you that three weeks ago as the crisis mounted, we moved from overweight to neutral risk assets and instructed our managers not to buy the dips. So sitting today, we are underweight equities. We're gonna stay there at underweight for the moment, 
But we have achieved phase one. And phase one for us is central bank backstop that normalizes market conditions. This means we will tentatively add back some risk. We're going to do that by buying more gold. We're going to do that by buying more investment grade corporate bonds as that market begins to normalize. To move to stage two, we need to know more about the economics. We need to have done our stress tests. We need to know how deep this fall is going to be. And we need to know what the effect of the government support will be. When we know that, we will begin to add equity exposure back. To move overweight, we need one more thing, phase three. We need to know a little bit more about the longevity of the crisis, the likelihood of a vaccine, possible interim treatments, and the sort of dates for the end to shutdown so we can model. So we're at phase one of what I'm afraid will still be a long and slow climb. And while I'm glad to report the portfolio drawdowns have been much mitigated by the rally of the last few days, we're still looking at sharp corrections in many more equity focused portfolios. But we are making our first steps to regain some of the capital lost. Thank you.